Die Sprachübertragung beginnt jetzt. Alle Teilnehmer befinden sich im Zuhörermodus. Yes, hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's uh, BAI Webinar. Uh, it's about infrastructure debt and emerging markets, high protection against credit risks in times of COVID-19. So no doubt a very interesting topic. And I'm welcoming our today's speaker. It's Jean-François Louche. Um, he's an expert and he will further outline uh, why he is an expert on this. You will know in a sec. Before we start, I would like uh, to do some introducing um, remarks. Um, so as you can see here, first of all, uh, there are other webinars upcoming, uh, still in September, of course, also in October and November. But uh, these are the next two ones, also very interesting topics. Um, then, um, I mean, here, I, I guess the slide might be interesting for you. Uh, it's outlining strategies targeted by infrastructure investors. And you can see for that it has been 34% in Q2 2020, um, uh, which is interesting and uh, already gives a good idea that that is uh, increasingly in, in interesting for investors. Um, on the next slide, uh, you will see some more information on infrastructure. So today's topic is infrastructure. So let's have a closer look uh, what's what's happening here. And as you can see on this slide, renewable energy is a very, very important part on, in infrastructure. And this is also true for uh, first half 2020, as you can see on the very right. Next slide um, is providing some further information on fund types presenting best opportunities in infrastructure. I mean, here debt is only 17%, but I mean, debt is just different, of course, from, from core and, and other ones. Uh, you never know, I mean, of, of course, how exactly the survey was done, but I'm sure today's speaker will further outline um, um, aspects of debt, why this is interesting and what to be expected, especially talking about the emerging markets. And with this, I would like to hand over to Jean-Francis. Thank you, Jean-Francis. Thank you, Anessa. So good morning, everyone. Uh, maybe a bit of German. I ich möchte gerne auf Deutsch sprechen, but es wird auf Englisch besser sein. So, Entschuldigung. And I will, uh, I will switch to, to English, which uh, to add to every everybody is not my uh, mother uh, tongue language. Uh, there's a bit of French in me. So, so thank you for, for joining us. Perhaps just as an introduction, uh, I am the, the global head of infra infrastructure and structured finance for uh, Edmond Rothschild, and, uh, and as part of our uh, business, we 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 are focusing a, a lot on infrastructure debt, uh, and I am the, the CIO also of uh, our infrastructure debt platform, which is uh, based uh, for most of our the, the team members in in London. We have a few. Uh, in our headquarters in, uh, in Geneva as well. So we have a very interesting team theme uh, today, in infrastructure debt in a, in, with a focus on emerging markets. And uh, if it was, uh, wasn't uh, good enough, we, we decided to add a spin of a, a risk metrics and uh, from the element of protection, which is a feature of uh, infrastructure debt and in the context of COVID-19. So, so I'm very jealous because I, I've seen the next topics that seems a bit more, more, more straightforward, but uh, I'm up for, for the challenge. And uh, um, I, I think there are some, um, some attendees who uh, we know well for what we, we do for infrastructure debt in, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, sometimes uh, the broader OECD. So, uh, well, you know what, uh, emerging markets can be the, the next challenge, but uh, as a firm, we're of course very much committed to uh, Europe and OECD. So, there are several elements, as I mentioned, in, in the topic we, we're going to discuss today. So, I thought that might be interesting to maybe come back to some fundamentals of, uh, of uh, what uh, uh, infrastructure debt is, uh, is about. Uh, would be good as well to um, you know to to analyze what instruments we have available because I, I saw in the in the in the few slides that uh, there was a split of uh, how you can invest 
and, and these debt instruments are relevant in emerging markets as well. And uh, there's, of course, the question of uh, COVID. And I think COVID, uh, perhaps as an introduction, introduction statement, COVID has tested uh, if the protection that, uh, you know, kind of are embedded in infrastructure that worked or not. And, uh, and you can wonder also, before we, we go deeper into what the emerging market opportunity is, we can go perhaps a bit also deeper in terms of, you know, is infrastructure debt, how does it compare with, with corporate debt? Because uh, we, we've seen in the early part of the, the COVID pandemic, unfortunately, that uh, corporate spread um, increased. So I'm going to try to see how we can play with that presentation. So these are a bit. I'm going to press the next one. Hoping that I was told there's two seconds. So before I go into a summary of infrastructure debt, and I, and I suppose that some of you are quite familiar with uh, what defines infrastructure debt, we could also ask ourselves the question of what does emerging markets mean? And, uh, and when I started my, my career, uh, some time ago, early 90s, uh, I started to work in uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, LATAM, and, and you would definitely consider that you were in emerging markets in the, in the early 90s. Now, it's a bit tricky because a lot of these countries have matured. Some of the countries in these regions are investment grade. So I'm always cautious about calling, you know, a country or a region emerging markets. But I would say that, you know, hopefully that, uh, that we resonate with, with much of, of the attendees. I will consider that uh, emerging market is almost what is uh, outside of, uh, of Europe uh, and, uh, and maybe some core, core countries of OECD. And you know, perhaps during the, the Q and A, we you you may have questions about more specific regions. You know, I don't know some countries in Africa, some uh, some countries in Asia. Who who knows? So, you know, I will try to to make it as entertaining as possible. But yeah, infrastructure debt um, is a very broad universe, and that broad universe applies in uh, in emerging market too. Uh, so, you know, it's transport, social, energy, utilities, telecoms. Within these uh, sub-sectors, you have sub-sectors. So if you look at energy, you can have the, the conventional energy production. As Annette said, there's a, an obvious shift uh, towards renewable energy, cleaner energy. The same applies for transport. Uh, and it, it, it is a fascinating time, actually, to invest in the asset class because there's also a, a technological shift. And, uh, and I remember when we, we, we started to approach investors and, and explain the benefits of investing in infrastructure debt, we were really using that kind of a split above. But, but I think now, you know, we, we can even say that the mission statement of a lot of investors in infrastructure is about energy transition, uh, digital infrastructure, telecoms, towers, fiber optic, modernization of utilities, uh, energy efficient social infrastructure, cleaner transport mobility. So that is perhaps very European, but you know, even in emerging markets, even in Africa, uh, we advised a few years ago, a few renewable energy projects in, uh, in Africa. And, and, and you know, it's interesting because I think one interesting theme of uh, infrastructure is the interconnectivity of infrastructure and uh, emerging markets are sometimes a reminder of that uh, you need uh, transport to bring your natural resources to to a site uh, you need uh, a power plant to develop a city to provide the the electricity you may need the transport to bring the fuel uh, before the renewable energy to to these sites and, and sometimes conventional energy is a way to transit to cleaner energy uh, telecoms has always been very, very, very hot in, a, in, a, in emerging markets. And, and again, I remember when 20 years ago, I, I joined a, a bank where I, where I was doing project finance, focusing on telecoms. Uh, I was, you know, the, the younger banker who wanted to, to, to work on the big projects and a lot of the big mobile rollouts were in Europe, of course, in Italy, in Germany, 
in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were these jumbo acquisitions of operator. And suddenly you're, you're looking at the project in, in Cameroon for 30, 40 million. And uh, there's a, an ego moment of wondering, is it really what, what I want to do? But you get interesting it, and, and, and you realize also that that's a thing we will develop from one region to another, the drivers can be different. And, uh, and I remember 20, 25 years ago, telecoms mobile network, and we're not talking 5G, but 2G, maybe 3G, uh, was all about penetration rates. So you would be in Germany, you would be a third operator, you would assume there can be a 25, 30% penetration rate. And if as a third operator, you take a 15% market share, you're, 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 you're a hero. So when suddenly you look at a business plan in, uh, in Africa, you see that the penetration rate is 75% supported by uh, market studies. You see that, uh, you know, actually it's not about contracts, like, you know, where you have a contract and you prepay the service, but it's a kind of pay as you go. And, I was, and, and, and each operator will get 30, 35% market share. And I was totally skeptical in these days until someone explained to me, uh, well, how would you have a contract? How, will, how would you bill? How would you even send an invoice to, to some you know, people in, in, in countries where there's, there's no postcode system? And, uh, and equally, a 75% uh, market penetration in these countries at the time, uh, communication was crucial. So it was very interesting because even if there are lots of things that can be transported from, say, European markets to emerging markets, there are also different drivers because there are also different uh, population behaviors. And that makes also uh, the, these markets uh, fascinating to, to, um, to, uh, to, to develop and, and, and be in a position to contribute to, to financing uh, uh, infrastructure projects is, is always also uh, fulfilling. So in terms of infrastructure debt, we carry on. So broad universe, uh, enormous number of countries. The, the volumes are huge. I mean, you know, there, there are so many figures, uh, you know, until 2040 now, the, the estimated financing needs is, is, is close to 100 uh, trillion. Uh, in Europe, we used to say that until 2020, there would be close to, to 2,000 billion of, uh, of, of needs. I always say, you know, after almost 30 years in this market, the, 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 it's, it's, it's an infinite market. Uh, and, and, and for many reasons, uh, there are technological developments, so you need to build new infrastructure. Uh, there are, you know, telecoms, digital infrastructure is a good example. Uh, there's a technology, technological shift, you know, transport is about uh, clean mobility. Uh, you need to upgrade infrastructure, uh, utilities, water treatment, storage, uh, there needs to be uh, an upgrade. And, and when you have been working uh, two or three decades in this business, suddenly the, the motorway you, you finance in, in Croatia is in need of widening, expansion, rehabilitation, and uh, there's more money that need to kick in. Plus, there's also a theme of clever motorways. So you need to ensure that uh, uh, not only the motorway is upgraded, but that motorway needs to be able to communicate with uh, you know, the mobile network, fiber optic, whatever we, we use. So it's fascinating. It's a recurrent funding need. And uh, you know, uh, I think we've known and, and we pitch some of you being totally transparent. Uh, there's, there's, there's been a huge opportunity for, for institutions to uh, contribute to the financing and to act uh, either with a team within some, for example, insurance company or with uh, asset managers being mandated to invest money from institutions. I think in the last four years, we, we've been really observing a rise in uh, institutions and, uh, and being as what I call true alternative uh, lenders in the infrastructure that space. How do you invest? Well, you know, again, uh, most of you would know, but uh, you know, the three components of financing an infrastructure asset are on the right, the, the equity, and, uh, and that has been, you know, uh, very, very successful 
in terms of attracting money from, from institutions in, in billions, the, the larger funds are double digit billion uh, asset under management. But in the last five years, we, we've seen the emergence of a, of a wide, uh, large uh, infrastructure debt platforms. You know, even us as Edmond Rothschild, we, we have 3 billion and, and growing, but uh, some have uh, close to, to 10 billion. And, uh, and this is healthy because, uh, you know, the, the typical structure of uh, financing an asset is 60 to 90 percent about debt. Another two types of, of debt instruments, there's the, the, the senior debt, let's say it's average portfolio, triple B uh, rating, investment grade. For insurance company, the, the regulator has designed in Europe the, 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 the favorable solvency to uh, infrastructure treatment, which especially for, for project, the, the project definition of it is quite attractive from a, from a solvency capital ratio standpoint. And I would say the senior debt is, uh, you're talking of a, you know, in these days, uh, an average 250 BIP spread is a very strong performance. But, you know, um, we'll come back to default rate recovery rate, but you, we're talking of an instrument which has a, you know, very low default rate, probably less than, than 2% at the scale of a portfolio, and a high recovery rate, uh, probably close to, to 100% if uh, the teams or the asset manager do a good work. So it's very fully secured, highly covenanted. And, uh, and then there's an interesting development of, uh, of junior debt, jun jun or what can be called yield plus debt, because sometimes it can be about taking a view on the develop technological development. And here I would say the underlying asset is similar to what would be done for senior debt. It's just a matter of whether more risk is taken because there's the contractual or legal subordination in terms of the, the positioning of the debt instrument. There's a higher risk. I mean, probably the default rate increases, you know, from over, over a five-year average life to 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 ten percent accumulated. But recovery rate can be an average seventy percent. So so it, it is attractive, and uh, and I would say that most uh, the, the the best performing uh, asset managers know that uh, probability is one thing, but one default is enough to to totally erode the, the confidence of investors. So, so even for the, 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 the yield plus debt or the junior debt, there's, a, there's even more discipline, I would say. And the, and the opportunity is quite interesting as well because it's less intimidated by banks. So the, the sophisticated asset managers can really act as a pure arrangers of these debt instruments. And important, these in debt instruments are also totally required in emerging markets. In terms of a um, bit of a lag here, but we'll get there. Um, let's see what we can do. I don't know if Roland is working, but uh, I seem to be stuck on the on the on the presentation. Here we go. Yeah, there's a, there's a slide about how you compare debt versus equity. I think it's interesting because whatever the market is, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are global equity players already who invest across, um, uh, you know, all countries, all continents. That includes emerging markets. Um, debt, yes, although our view would be more that you can have maybe more regional uh, mandates where you focus maybe on one, two regions. We'll, we'll come back to it later. But a global debt play is totally possible. But I would say that, you know, what makes uh, debt attractive uh, the, the, these days is uh, yes, you got predictable cash flows. Uh, you 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 have a regulated the benefit from regulated assets, which offer predictability of cash flows. Security package is strong, so it's a different game. I, I would say you don't have the J-curve effect of equity. There's not a bet, a crystal ball. You know, we we were talking actually of the transaction in a in a. In, in, in Asia a few days ago with a private equity fund, uh, which involves some, uh, some, uh, some uh, market risk. And they were saying that basically they need to make a call on what would be the, the price of electricity in this country in 15 years, and whether they're ready to, to bet uh, their investors' money uh, against you know, an, a, a view on, on price at that horizon. That 
bit different. We will have PPA, we will use whatever, but you know, there will be a, a recurrent yield offered to, to investors. So, so yes, it might be a bit less uh, uh, juicy. Uh, double DGs unlikely, or, or that means that the asset manager is playing a, 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 an, equity, an equity play. But most importantly, uh, the debt you don't have a board cost, for example. You know the cost of bidding for a transaction, all the due diligence costs are borne by the borrower. So in essence, investors really pay for money deployed. And uh, once an asset is booked, because 80% of an infra debt portfolio will be mature brownfield assets or acquisitions. Uh, the yield is generating uh, relatively uh, uh, soon after uh, making uh, the first investments. Benefits of investing in infrastructure debt, and again, these themes really apply to, to, to emerging markets. Uh, you know, I mentioned a few long-term stable cash flow, uh, low risk, high recovery rate. There's a, there's, you know, a low correlation to economical uh, cycles to 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 uh, to the volatility of international markets that can be uh, uh, interesting there's always an element of linked to 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 inflation as well some some debt instrument can actually be structured with a, a cpi index so that can also be attractive you're in a buy and hold strategy so yes there's a probably a bit uh, a, a kind of illiquidity premium uh, even a complexity premium because structuring a debt instrument is complex to protect investors, but yeah, that's a, that's a, an asset class that uh, that is uh, definitely for for buy and hold strategies. So there will be a few slides about default rate, but I think I've, I've mentioned it. But but I think infrastructure debt fares nicely, for example, against a, a, a corporate rate with a, an equivalent credit worthiness. If you compare, you know, the the the, the triple B space, uh, it's uh, the the graphs we 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 have here is quite a, a self-explanatory and I think also and that's important uh, even more so in emerging markets uh, perhaps where we will see that the tenor of the loans can be a bit shorter um, you know perhaps senior debt in Europe uh, can go up to 35 40 years in our portfolios I guess we're more in the in the 16, 15 20 years of maximum of average tenor but because of the contractual repayments, which you can see on that um, on that slide, which is a very theoretical simulation we we have made, but I think the important point is to see. I don't know if you can see my my arrow. That uh, you know, uh, even for a 15-year say uh, average portfolio tenor, by year six, seven, uh, or maybe seven, eight, half of the portfolio has been uh, has been repaid. So, so there's also that element of, uh, of redemption, which I think in emerging markets can be interesting because as much as we will see that we can mitigate uh, the political risk, uh, it's, it, it, there, there can be you know, some, some, uh, perhaps a, a perception of more volatility. Key risk of infrastructure debt, again, I guess the, uh, the, the, it, many of you must, uh, must be familiar. But uh, I think what is important more than the risk is, is the solution. And for example, we say, you know, we need to ensure that the debt is repaid, of course, <laughs> that we, we have strong uh, structures. And then the solution on the right is, I would say, it's the quality of the, the management team because infrastructure debt is very heavily covenanted. What do we mean by that? We, we have that information undertaking so we can monitor the assets, there are financial covenants, leverage, debt service cover ratio. It has to be tailor-made to the need of an asset. We can even embed uh, operational milestones. Uh, telecoms, you may want uh, a certain rate of deployment of, uh, of the network. In the old days, especially in emerging markets, motorways, you would want a certain level of traffic. But what is important is to have covenants that make sense. Uh, by that, covenants that gives you true right, where you can sit at the table. If something happens, you can say, hey, this is what my uh, finance documents say. So I would wish to sit at the table with the other lenders and the sponsors. And if we anticipate, because infrastructure debt is also about preventing credit events, not curing them, 
even more important in emerging markets, then you want to have such rights. And, and you know that can be from preventing uh, a change of control because you lend with the comfort of the sponsors. And then you can argue that the equity is in, but you're really concerned about the quality of the operator, of the equipment suppliers, of the fuel supply contract, of uh, how a purchase, you know, power purchase agreement will be will be um, uh, renewed. So all that you want to 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 cover these risks, and equally, uh, in a play where infrastructure debt can be seen, especially for uh, for institutions at the long term liability matching uh, product, what well, you want to avoid. Uh, too much refinancing and decrease of the, the amounts invested. So you, you want that, you want a strong security package. And uh, we'll come back to it on, on, on COVID, but it's nice to say things, I've got reserve account, I can draw upon if there's a, a lack of liquidity on, my, on, on the asset I finance and ensure that that is repaid. You want to know that it has been sized properly and you can use it. Telling you that with a high recovery rate, great, but how do I enforce it? And especially in emerging markets, you need to take a view as to how the judge will uh, respond to a claim. In the rare case, the security package would be enforced. And that is also a decision that would make uh, an experienced asset manager decide, I am not going to invest there because as much as the quality of uh, my concession agreement, for example, if it's a, a, a public-private partnership situation as strong as it is, if I know that the judge may take two, three, four years to enforce a decision and then I'm relying on payments of finance authorities which will need to be funded by XYZ uh, supranational, you may be there for 10 years before you see the money that contractually should be repaid after X amount of time. So that is also important. It is everywhere the case, and you don't need to go in emerging market to see this risk, but this is part of the equation. Political regulatory risk will come back to it, essential. I guess the game in emerging market is you may need not only to invest in a sound country with, with, with a proven regulatory framework, but it's also about sometimes mitigating such a political risk. All the risks like merchant, commercial, there can be credit enhancements to perhaps less stake Let's uh, take less uh, commercial risk. What is a commercial risk? It can be basically it's the revenue generation of the asset. There are mitigants, but equally uh, you want to be protected about uh, you know risk of um, uh, nationalization, expropriation, vandalism, and we try to make it a bit entertaining with a, a few stories. And again, the whole concept still on that slide of maintenance, refurbishment. We're often asked, you know, and perhaps even more in emerging market, but do you generate more yield if you invest in a green field with a construction risk? And the answer is no, not really, because you're there to mitigate the risk. But actually the operation is certainly the long-term operation, which is probably the long-term exposure to a debt instrument is crucial. And this is why you need to ensure you understand as an asset manager, what the renewal program will be. Uh, if an asset makes sense, over a certain period of time. All that is part of the equation and the experience of the asset managers and also what we call a, a risk transfer to the people who are the best suited to do it. So that's why we try to, to transfer to subcontractors, equipment supplier, the, 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 the operator, some of these risks on a, on a back to back basis. So getting a bit quicker, the monitoring of an investment, which is that 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 uh, that slide, basically it's it's a summary of all the all that you know is built into a security package. Whether you know this is a share pledge, this is a reserve account, asset pledge, it's a lot of documentation technique, but it shows the complexity of what you're trying to do versus maybe a, a straighter uh, a corporate corporate loan. And, and, and the goal really for us as an asset manager uh, is to protect investors. Yes, deliver the strong risk return profile, except no loss. That's perhaps a key difference with banks. I remember when I was writing a credit application for banks, I would write, well, this is the possible write-off in a worst, worst case scenario. I can tell you we present no transaction with the concept of potential write-off to, uh, to our investment uh, committee. 
I wouldn't be talking to you now. Now maybe a bit of a, you know, how, how, what defines a, a strong in infrastructure that funds? Uh, proven track record, crucial. You need an experienced team. You need team with relationship with the sponsors who develop the project. And by, by relationship, it's important from a sourcing standpoint. It's important also when you need to deal with credit event. You, you, it's a small world. People know each other. If there's credibility, you're very likely to reach a fair position with the equity holder of an asset. Same with the governments. I mean, we are, are often pride ourselves to have been advising governments, emerging markets, and uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more developed countries. That's essential sometimes when you need also to amend some of the uh, regulatory uh, aspects, contractual aspects of a, of a transaction. Knowledge of the international market key, especially for today. Sectors knowledge essential because of the diversification of the portfolio, uh, because also of the need to be able to move. Sometimes sectors are, you know, generate more yield than others with a very, very strong risk profile. That is why, you know, when we design our own team, we wanted people covering all the sectors and with more than 20 years experience in these sectors, not just to pile up numbers, but that means that at some stage I've seen difficult things. I'll, I'll give you a few examples later. Origination, experience, structuring, monitoring credit, this is the fundamental. But as you can see, I truly believe also, even more so in emerging market, that understanding the industrial aspect of a transaction Having worked with governments, it's as essential as being able to, to, to do the, the finance credit work around the debt instrument. And uh, then, you know, again, it rebounds of having a very strong network uh, of relationship with key players. And, and, and it is essential because most of you will know that a lot of the sponsors to the projects, although we're very, very, very demanding in terms of the quality of the industrial partners, but a lot of the equity is brought by financial sponsors, you need to make sure that uh, you know they are also supported by sound uh, investors, so that you know their alignment of interest is, is there. COVID, COVID affected the, the whole world. You can see the rising numbers in uh, I don't know India, the Middle East. Uh, it, it spreads everywhere. The impact of it is probably I wouldn't say similar, but in terms of affecting the infrastructure assets, our view, and I will summarize the, the, the next two slides, is that you know anything like airports, roads, especially roads in the ramp up, anything that needed mobility uh, has been affected. Uh, as an asset manager, we've always been aware of that. And when we venture into these assets, that's very with a strong, strong, strong track record. And even airports, we have, always been, 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 been cautious to a certain degree and, and we've seen the effect it had. On the contrary, the renewable energy sector uh, boded quite well uh, and we've seen development in emerging markets again to, to, to be discussed a bit later. But, uh, you know, even there we can't be complacent because, you know, if the production uh, environment decreases, if there are less people going to work, there's a lesser consumption of electricity. And we've seen if you need to have structured the debt with sufficient cushion uh, so that you can live with a decrease of such production and, uh, and keep the, the, the project on track with no breach of covenants. Digital infrastructure has probably been one of the winners because of the, the work from home. How does it apply to truly emerging markets? Well, it will still be a winner because in emerging markets, the ability to, to, to actually, maybe you could argue that emerging markets have been a pioneer of uh, homeschooling because, you know, this is what happens. And you have villages where in, in the most underdeveloped countries where you have a bit of a, a satellite or, or fiber optic uh, connection, you have a, a mini renewable plant to provide the, the energy. And that's how you, you can provide the health education, uh, care to, 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 to the population. So, so you see, although with different drivers, there are similarities in terms of, um, of uh, how uh, COVID could, uh, could affect uh, infrastructure asset class. The debt has been very resilient. Uh, and uh, I think 
probably created opportunities for asset managers and institutions because some banks may be hard to reallocate liquidity on more corporate type uh, product. Uh, I wouldn't make it a generic rule, but as an asset manager ourselves, uh, it has been a record year and even more on, on, in control of the of 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 debt structures. Uh, in terms of write-off, I mean, if I was to talk from our own platform, there's been no write-off. We do not anticipate write-off. We had kind of anticipated there could be a second wave. So for the few assets, and when I say few assets, to give you some perspective, out of 50 assets, there are two where we, we had kind of material waiver close to restructuring situations. Uh, but I can tell you the business plans we, we developed were not about two or three months of, uh, of COVID impact, but uh, way longer. And for some transactions, you know, earlier I mentioned the importance of security package. Uh, we have been able to use some of the, of the, the debt service reserve accounts and which have been um, replenished uh, because some assets recovered quicker than others. But again, uh, I think the, the, the positive conclusion um, and I would say globally, is that if you've avoided the obvious uh, suspects in terms of suffering from, a, from a, a significant lack of revenue, like some transport assets, uh, infrastructure has been, a, has been a pretty resilient. So, in terms of infrastructure debt versus corporate debt, I won't spend too much time on it, but I, I guess the key message is COVID made it a bit perhaps of a question mark in, in March. Even now we can see that with the corporate index having increased, say triple B was suddenly close to 250 to 60 bips. There might have been a bit of a question mark of arbitrage versus the, 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 the senior debt. The corporate index seems to be going a bit, a bit lower. Um, what's going to happen if there's a, a, maybe more concern, more volatility because of the second wave? We don't have the crystal ball, but I think what is important to say is the experienced asset managers reprice deal that can be through market flex in, a, in, the, in the term sheets negotiated with borrowers. That can be also saying we're not going to invest in the sub 200 triple B. And right now in Europe, outside of the emerging market theme, uh, we consider that there may be a rally for cheaper triple B infrastructure dates uh, closer to 150 than the the, the, the mid 200. Uh, there's no need, uh, we believe, to crystallize such pricing. And then when you're in that 250 bips with the default rate, the recovery rate, uh, and with the quality of the, the documentation that gives control, uh, infrastructure debt remains uh, very uh, attractive versus corporate debt. And then the few slides about default rate, cumulative loss, you know, they're, they're interesting to, 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 to read, but, uh, but I believe that um, uh, we, we, we kind of mentioned them a bit. What is interesting, though, is maybe on that tier, we can see that what is interesting also with the uh, infrastructure debt is the, 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 the assets de-risk over time. And that can be very interesting as well because it applies also in emerging markets. Usually, you know, once an asset is in place, there's a de-risking of it, and that, that can be also interesting in terms of the evolution of the, the, the risk return. So now, what is it basically to invest in, a, in emerging markets? And uh, again, with the caveat of that certain emerging market can be very strong investment grade LATAM or, uh, or Asian uh, countries. So perhaps the key risk back here, sorry, might be that uh, there's an element of, um, of FX risk, because I would say that the, the US dollar is, uh, is probably the, the currency in uh, outside of Europe and emerging markets. The other solution is to maximize the local funding. And actually, I often say that infrastructure debt backed by institutions is almost an old school concept. Why am I saying that? Is because in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, where we were financing, for example, power plants, roads, or, or mobile networks in uh, Africa, in India, uh, in some countries of Asia or Latin America, or even even Middle East, um, we were sometimes using the 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 the, the 
liquidity from uh, local institutions. Uh, for example, in, in 2002, there was a, an operator in Kenya, uh, which, uh, which was backed by Vodafone, and it was 80% financed by what we call a local credit enhanced bond issue, where the local, basically, uh, insurance companies were providing the liquidity, and uh, credit enhancers like export credit agencies or the likes of uh, multilateral institutions like uh, the IFC, uh, which is part of the World Bank Group, EBRD, uh, for, for Central Eastern Europe, or bilateral institutions, development institutions, uh, say ProParco in France, uh, or um, DG in a, in a, in a, you know, at the time KFW actually in, in Germany uh, before it changed its status. So they were basically providing an insurance on political risk, commercial risk, so that the bond would be triple B rated, which then enabled the local institutions to bring their liquidity. And that is something, you know, we can do in emerging markets. I mean, there can be countries where there's a strong political risk, where we may not want to take the, the, some of the commercial risk. And uh, for example, export credit agencies who are keen to support uh, the export of equipment or a sponsor, let's say I used to work for French contractor Bouygues, the French COFAS as, a, as, a, as a, an export credit agency would accept to cover 95% of the polit political risk. So that could be expropriation, nationalization, acts of vandalism. And they would even for a motorway, let's think of one in Croatia, uh, they would accept to cover 70, 75% of the revenue risk. And uh, that could be interesting because then, you know, as an institution, you know, you could have been uh, in a debt that is a solid triple B rated through the credit enhancement, uh, perhaps even closer to, to, to A because of the quality of the, of the export credit agencies. And you would have, um, uh, you know, 250, 280, 290 uh, beeps. So this is where it can be interesting because also with these international institutions bringing the credit enhancement, but also some documentation standards, uh, you can be in a very, very safe uh, environment. And, uh, and, uh, and that is, I think, what makes uh, emerging market debt uh, interesting. And an opportunity because uh, banks have been efficient, local banks, regional boards are, have been inefficient, but we'll see it later, the, the, the financing needs in the different geographies of, uh, of emerging markets are, are, are enormous. So what we have here was a bit of, these are the players uh, in this game, but if we look at here, where we could say institutions as alternative lender, we can use these guys, these, sorry, <laughs> a bit of a glitch here, the multilateral to um, wrap up some of the key risks and, uh, and also some private uh, insurance company who, who provide also uh, similar products and uh, enable um, the, 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 the risk to, to be decreased. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the, the people are quite clever. The, the World Bank, for example, uh, provides a, a product uh, 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 which basically credit enhance the obligation of the country that is tendering, basically the Ministry of Transport, under a concession agreement. So if they guarantee to make payments, like in a, a PPP, availability base in Europe, where the, the state makes payment to the, to, to the borrower and ultimately its lenders, then that payment can be uh, guaranteed under a program from the, the World Bank called the, the Partial Risk Guarantee. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, with all that in mind, you can, and here in that table, for, you know, some region, investment grade Asia, for senior debt, expect, you know, um, spread of 200, 400 BIPs, for subordinated debt, probably up to 600, maybe seven. Then it becomes for us more of an equity play. Uh, uh, and, and this is not what I think is healthy. We, we have to stay in a, in a sound uh, credit, uh, credit debt program. But you can see Latin America, 300, 250, 300 bits is doable for senior debt with uh, in investment grade credit worthiness. So 
emerging market can be a, an interesting extension of the perhaps the more European market that uh, some European institutions have uh, have uh, strongly and very efficiently contributed to directly or with uh, the support of, uh, of asset managers. But emerging market is is not scary, and actually, and this is where maybe I can give you a bit more more examples. Uh, you can see the default and recovery rate on, on that page are reasonable when you look at it uh, region by, by region. So it's a, it's a broader index, but it gives a, a good perspective. And, and why? Well, especially in the field of infrastructure, because you know some of the development institutions, some parapublic institutions from you know strong developed countries are also bringing some financial contributions to these projects. They're also monitoring that the, the governance, the regulatory aspects are met. So it can be very, very disciplined. And it's really a question of picking the right country. But overall, emerging markets have, have proven quite strong as well in terms of default and, uh, and recovery rate. In terms of volume, quickly before I go spend five minutes maybe giving you a bit more uh, live uh, experience, if I may say. Uh, you look at Asia Pacific, there's a lot of activity in Indonesia, India, China, of course, but uh, Vietnam. Uh, these countries have grown in the last 20 years. The, 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 the political framework is much stronger. You're talking of 60, 70 billion a year of, uh, of debt uh, of debt requirements. Latin America, it's 30, 30 billion. Latin America, a lot of renewable energy projects, a lot of transport projects. Telecoms, maybe uh, less so, whereas in Asia, telecoms, renewable energy is quite, uh, is quite strong. Um, Middle East, North Africa, quite strong, you know, 20 billion. There are interesting developments in some countries that try to develop PPP program. They want to improve the, 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 the energy uh, network. Uh, there are some improvements needed in terms of providing uh, you know, broadband. So the digital infrastructure is very much a theme too. Sub-Saharan Africa uh, can be volatile, but there's, again, you know, you're talking of 20, uh, you know, 20, 15, 20 billion a year. So, so the universe is, is huge. And you know, we put our own credential as a, as a as a, as as in Mount Rothschild and a few case studies, uh, we we we've been quite involved in 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 many in many countries as a team over the last uh, 20 30 years. But I think what is important is to give you a, a few examples in the last perhaps three minutes. Uh, it's I remember when we went we did mobile networks in I'm talking 2000 in uh, Cameroon. Uh, where we were nervous about, uh, you know, Cameroon, in Nigeria, Nigeria, there could be acts of vandalism. So yes, you would think you need to put base stations to have a mobile network, but what if suddenly a part of the population decides to, to put them down? Uh, well, you know, you can use boats, and there are boats uh, outside, and, and, and you use them at redundant capacity. Uh, mentioned it to you, you know, when we saw the, the, the different dynamics of um, uh, telecoms uh, revenue drivers, where Europe was all about signing contracts with solid, I would say, counterparties. In, uh, in Africa, it was almost, uh, no, 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 rely totally of, uh, at the crossing of the road, people selling SIM cards. This is where you make a lot of money and achieve huge uh, penetration rate. Um, Indonesia, we, we, we did a power plant, beautiful power plant, strong sponsors, uh, good debt, good terms, uh, very strong, uh, you know, debt package. And uh, two weeks before the closing, suddenly we realized there were some monkeys invading the, the site. And unfortunately, that was a, a protected species. So here we go, uh, 800 million dollars uh, project that can progress and a lot of work in it, a lot of studies. You learn from this. And, uh, and, I, and I often say that the, the strong uh, debt, infra debt asset managers must understand the, the industrial aspects, the regulatory aspect. It's about experience because the first part of security, even more so in emerging markets, is that you understand if, as, as, a, as, a, as an investor, if uh, the asset makes sense. And uh, you need also to, to, to know, and a few more stories, um, the, the documentation 
there you need to understand because of all the parties involved, the credit enhancers, maybe some local banks, maybe some development financial institutions, us uh, as, a, as a, a representing institutions, you have very complex debt structure and it's totally workable and efficient. But that means as an asset manager, you need to understand what we call the intercreditor issues, which in Europe, often it's a straight loan, a piece of equity. Maybe when there's junior, there's a bit of intercreditor to manage the subordination. Here you can have different sets of covenants, different sets of documentation. You need to be fluent, and this is where we believe asset managers can add a lot of values in these in these markets, whether it's senior or junior debt. And uh, two story, we did uh, the first, uh, and that's the case study afterwards in a, in a, in a, in a, in Africa. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we did the first. Uh, PPP, Toro PPP in Senegal, part of the presidential projects. We're actually advising the authorities here. And it was funny because it, it went so fast and the project operates well. Huh? It's not fast as rushed. Uh, that uh, the, fine, the press focused on infrastructure at the time when PPP in Europe was so huge. Question, why can you implement from A to Z in 15 months uh, Toro's concession in, uh, in Senegal? when it can take uh, three years to do the same in France, uh, Germany was more efficient, and, <laughs> and the UK. So, you know, that was, that was interesting, but that shows also that the potential is there and we shouldn't associate emerging markets with more time to deploy. The market is there, experienced asset managers can, can do things, but experienced managers need also to understand, you know, on that project, there was an issue at some stage, and guess what? It wasn't the construction of the asset. It wasn't even the operation of the asset. Yes, during the procurement period, we had to manage the old school uh, uh, authorities wanting to do it the old way of a civil work law. So no PPP, no, no public private partnership. But actually, when we the project was in operation after two two years, we had a very complex engineer-driven uh, indexation clause for the the, the, pay, the toll definition. So what the user paid, and the only thing we underestimated is if we don't run such toll, well then happened what happened. There was not enough coin that the central banks would produce. And so we had to renegotiate the contract, suspend a bit the operation on the motorway to come up with something a bit more clever. So a bit of you know, concrete experience also of what it means to invest in, uh, in emerging markets. But I would say the key, key, key messages are, well, there's an opportunity. Uh, you can, as we know, we've seen in your upper infrastructure generate corporate type spreads or above with a strong documentation and security package, low default rate, high recovery rate. The market is huge, everlasting. Uh, it's still a way to, 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 to really develop very diversified portfolio with granularity in terms of political risk, regulatory risk, equipment suppliers, technologies, subsectors. Uh, this can be part of a, even a global uh, infrastructure debt mandate with further diversification, but still the possibility to to keep part of the portfolio in perhaps what would be from the perception of investors proven jurisdiction. And I think yes, the the, the asset class, even so in emerging market, has been resilient to 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 the COVID nineteen. You have to be careful. You know, if population are affected, they can't travel, they can't come to build. But overall, we've learned also from uh, from that. And experienced sponsors can uh, can put you know contingency plan. And again, uh, I think the the whole play, if we can globalize by extending to emerging markets, bringing the liquidity of institutions to energy transition, clean mobility, digital infrastructure, key social infrastructure, modernization of utilities. Well, you know, institutions can yes build a very solid fixed income, attractive, diversified portfolio but we can also do it for a better planet. And okay. So, Francis, thank you very much for the interesting presentation and also for, for the summary. Um, um, yeah, the, the, I have uh, two questions. First is, you mentioned governance. Uh, I mean, as we all know, there are financial and non-financial governance. 
uh, you have been addressing some, some points with respect to non-financial covenants and risk mitigation, but could you maybe also elaborate a little bit on financial covenants if it comes to emerging markets? What, what are you, the most important ones from your point of view? You know, I think that that's similar to, to what we, we we see. So, of course, debt service cover ratio, loan life cover ratio, you know, which are the, 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 the traditional ones. But you, you also have more modern assets. You have, uh, uh, you know, the possibility to acquire pools of assets. Uh, and, and, and it's not now. It started actually 10, 15 years ago. So then you're maybe more back into leverage ratios, uh, you know, and... Um, the debt to equity is, is is crucial. Do we have to put more equity in emerging markets? Probably, if uh, if the the transaction bears a stronger political risk, it is true that uh, even if you have the support of a, of a, of the strongest credit enhancers that I mentioned earlier, uh, it's more unlikely to to start a new project with a social availability base with a 95 debt to equity. But I would say the the usual metrics are, are similar to what we see in uh, in Europe. The sizing of it can be different. Maybe, you know, I don't know if it's a revenue risk. Instead of living with a 160, 170, you will want a, a two times a debt service cover ratio. So there's an element of prudence, which is also driven by the sensitivity analysis we will do. And again, some um, covenants might be non-financial but still metric covenants that can be important in terms of measuring you know telecoms number of base stations deployed certain level of market penetration uh same you know maybe for for for, for some metrics linked to to other sectors but i would say there's a, a not a huge uh, difference in terms of the, the covenants it's more how you you set them up okay Thanks a lot. So at the right at the beginning of the webinar, I forgot to say all these slides and also the recording of this interesting presentation will be shared afterwards. Um, so to, just to mention this, uh, and I have one final question, and this is um, in terms of collaterals, what are the trends? So so what do you see as as um, uh, as collaterals? Um, are there any trends, or is it? Same as always, or, or just just a word on collateral split. You know, I think uh, hey, we set the trend <laughs> because we need to have the collateral that is adapted to a situation. It's funny you say trend because trend, uh, you know, I often say infrastructure. A lot of us have become dinosaurs in terms of how long we've been in that business. But unlike the dinosaurs, we're not instinct because we have to evolve and adapt every day to a new environment and new projects, new countries. But I would say in terms of the security package, it's twofold. You would want them, if it's project financing, the, the, the usual security package of, you know, share assets, key accounts, insurance proceeds, uh, strong debt service reserve accounts. Then it's a question of how do you, you size them? Because you may decide the risk is more important or you may decide there may be perhaps a bit more sometimes you know um, acts of vandalism and how much time will it take for the credentials to repay you so i would say this is where you need then to also articulate how you can enforce your security package and then there's also the question of enforceability is the judge reliable do you have a say will your documentation be read accordingly and this is why in some countries you want that political risk insurance so that you know that the standards, the European international, international law, by the way, never invest in a deal where you don't have the international law standard. And never invest in a deal where there's a concession agreement, it hasn't been drafted with the international law standards. But I think this is more what you need also to do sometimes, ensure that the country you, uh, you, you invested, either as a proven regulatory framework or the sufficient leverage from para public institution to ensure that the governance will be sound. Okay. We always have to ESG, you know, environment, social, justice, governance. Okay. So thanks a lot. This has been an extremely interesting hour. Um, and again, this presentation will be shared. Um, so uh, have a nice day, everyone, and hope to talk to you soon in another BAI webinar. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.